Welcome to the Productivity Show, a podcast where we believe that you can get the important things done without having to sacrifice your health, family, and things that matter to you. In today's episode, we'll catch you up on what's been happening in our industry and new trends that you need to be aware of so you stay ahead of the curve. If it's your first time listening, welcome. Thank you for chiming in here today. Uh, I want to kind of share like a quick background on the two of us here who are running the Productivity Show. My name is Tam Pham. I'm the founder and CEO of Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And we have like online courses, workshops, training to help people with productivity and then today, I'm also joined by my co-host, Brooks Duncan, who is the COO of Asian Efficiency. And we both came to productivity from completely different directions. So I started the company back in 2011 as a passion project to share what I was learning about productivity, time management, and goal setting. And it accidentally turned into a business where we're now one of the top productivity companies in the world. And I started working in corporate and I worked in corporate and startups for many years from like three person startups up to 55,000 person uh, public companies. So productivity is very different in both of those. I was actually an Asian efficiency customer before joining the team. So that's a little bit of background on me. And we started this podcast basically to help people become more productive at work and in life. And we think both of those are really, really important. And we really believe that happy people are productive people. Tan says that all the time. And so every week we share tips and strategies to help you win back time, have more energy and really get focused on what matters. Uh, so for myself, I'm married with two kids in Vancouver, Canada. I've worked from home for over a decade ever since my kids were toddlers. Uh, how about you, Tan? Do you have any uh, kids since last week or <laughs> or uh, what's a, what, where are you coming at this stuff from? Well, not that I'm aware of at least, but uh, a little bit of quick background on me. I'm a pretty young entrepreneur that's uh, based in Austin, Texas. I'm also uh, a big connector here in town where I connect people with resources and introductions that they need and looking for. Uh, so you kind of have a clue where we're both coming from. And sometimes we also have guests on the show as well. And some, sometimes it's just Brooks and I. So we're always going to mix it up and, and keep it fun and actionable as well. Yeah. And by the way, we love getting reviews and feedback from listeners. Uh, we had one from Arthur. He says, uh, we uh, sift through all the noise and recommend ideas and information that's super helpful. He says, uh, he says the thing that he enjoys most about the podcast and our masterclasses is how he finds helpful information, even when the topic doesn't really address anything specific in his life. <laughs> it sounds like a funny compliment, but that is exactly what we try to do that. We want everybody to be able to get something from every episode, even if when they look at the topic, maybe they think, oh, that doesn't really apply to me, but we want to make sure that everybody gets something from everyone from every episode. So if you want to get in touch, leave us a review on Apple or Spotify, or just email us podcast at asianefficiency.com. And today in you know, this episode, like I said, we want to make sure that everybody gets something. So we're going to be talking about three important topics. Number one, can a reduced distraction phone improve your attention? I'm fascinated by this subject of re reduced distraction phone. That's number one. Number two, the focus filters in iOS 16, I feel like they're really, really awesome. So we're gonna be exploring that a little bit. And then we're gonna talk about why personality tests are really, really underrated for teams. And so we're gonna get right into that, but Tan, we like to start every single episode with our top three resources. Uh, so I believe you have three for us. Absolutely. So the first resource I wanna share with you is a thing that you can, it's kind of like a sticker that you put on the back of your phone and it's called flow tag. So what this is, is you can have your own QR code. And when people scan it, they immediately get your contact information. So they have your name, your email address, your phone number, and all they have to do is just scan the QR code that's uh, on the back of your phone. So I recently got one. And now whenever someone wants to share contact information with me, instead of like saying, Hey, uh, you know, here's how you spell my name. This is my number. This is my Instagram. This is my email. Uh, I just tell them like, hey, go scan this QR code and there's everything you would ever need. So super handy and pretty affordable as well. So go check it out, Flow Tag. The second resource I want to recommend is a book called Key Person of Influence by Daniel Priestley. So this is a book I recently finished and it's basically a five-step framework to get to the top of your industry in about 12 months or less. And I like this book because it gives you a kind of like a step-by-step -step process of, okay, maybe I'm somebody who is 
really valuable and has a lot of skills, but nobody knows about me. And now you have kind of a path to figure out how do I get to the top of the industry? So everyone does know me, but also I get a lot more deal flow and opportunities presented to me because you're at the top of the industry. So getting to the top 10% of your space. And uh, I learned a lot from this book. So I wanted to recommend it as well. And then the third one is, this is kind of like an all encompassing thing, but with the AirPods, especially with the new ones coming out, I always recommend that people get a case. So there are a lot of cases that you can find on Amazon, but I, I like the rubber or silicone cases that allow you to differentiate between multiple AirPods that you might have. If you're like me, you have multiple ones. And so sometimes it's easy to differentiate when you have a case. So I highly recommend you check it out. There's so many of them. Pick the ones that you like, especially the color. Just go on Amazon. You'll find a bunch that uh, you can grab right away. So you can find links to everything that we just shared in the show notes by going to theproductivityshow.com or swipe in the podcast app and you'll see the links there as well. You know what? Your case recommendation is so timely because another use case for cases is that you can get ones. And again, it's just like cheap ones off Amazon. You can get ones that can hold an air tag. And these are really, really helpful for people who lose their AirPods all the time. So my oldest son and my wife are notorious about losing, <laughs> losing their AirPods. So I got my son uh, a case with an air tag and I ordered my wife one to put an air tag in and literally between, and it's coming tomorrow, but literally between the time I put the order in on Amazon and when it arrives tomorrow, uh, she's already lost her AirPods again. So <laughs> hopefully they'll turn up so I can put the case on her AirPods. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait. So just, I'm hearing this correctly. So you have a case for an AirPods where you can put an air tag in. That's right. Yeah. You just uh, put the air tag in and then you never need to worry about uh, losing your AirPods again. Uh, so for example, uh. my, yeah, my oldest son, he uh, crashed our car, which is a whole other topic, uh, but he left his AirPods in the car uh, so he can see which, uh, which towing yard it's currently at because he, because he has an air tag in there. Oh, that's funny you say that because I actually bought a four pack recently and I have three of them in use, but there's one I'm not using. And I think it's genius to have an ear tag associated with your AirPods. Yep. So I'm going to have to look into this case as well, because this is something, not that I ever lose my stuff, but this is always uh, handy to know. Yeah. Well, if you have teenagers, it comes in very, very handy. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, we are not talking about AirPod cases today. That's not the topic for today. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about the three topics I talked about earlier. But like we, when we do these kind of news and opinion episodes, we always like to start with some just like no newsworthy updates that are happening that we wanted to kind of bring to your attention in the productivity space or otherwise. Uh, so I'm just going to get started in town. I'm going to rope you in to get your thoughts on some of these. Number one, one is that Notion has released team spaces. So we actually talked about this in one of these episodes a few months ago. Notion held an event called Block by Block, and they talked about some new features, and some of them are starting to roll out. And one of them is team spaces. And I wanted to highlight it because uh, if you're listening to this and you don't see it, it will be coming to your workspace soon. But basically what this allows you to do is create teams in Notion, and it could be actually like actual teams, could be functional groups, could be like cross-functional projects, but it just lets you give a way to organize things and have it so that certain people have access to certain areas and certain teams spaces show up on your sidebar. So it just keeps things a lot more organized. And this is something that we, uh, this is something we learned a lot in time ago with Confluence, which is we don't use Notion internally. We use a tool called Confluence, but it's like, really, you want to make sure that people sh can only see the stuff that they need to see. A, because of an access thing, but more importantly, because if stuff is just too um, too cluttered, then you start can't find anything. So even if you don't really care about reducing access, uh, it just helps people keep things really, really clean. So if you haven't started using team spaces, definitely give that a try in Notion. Number two is the Wonderlist founders are creating a new productivity app called Superlist. So Wonderlist was a really, really popular task management app, had lots of big fans, and then it was purchased by Microsoft. Uh, and, you know, Microsoft kind of kept it alive for a while. Uh, but like these things always happen, eventually they killed Wonderlist, uh, the founders vested out and they left. And then Microsoft kind of like made Microsoft to do, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, but Wonderlist fans have been very, very sad. Well, now the founders are working on a new app called Superlist, and people are really, really excited. It's uh, you can work 
use it with your individual ta tasks. You can use it with team tasks. Uh, it has this cool looking real time multiplayer feature where people kind of like work on stuff together and send things back and forth. Uh, it looks really, really cool. I don't know if I would like switch from OmniFocus to it, uh, but I definitely am looking forward to checking it out. So you can go to superlist.com to sign up for the private beta. And of course, we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, links to that. And the third thing I wanted to give a head, heads up about is Apple held their far out event. <laughs> and we record these episodes live and Joel in the chat room is already talking about some of the things in it. Uh, but basically, uh, every September, generally, Apple holds a big September event. And usually they announce the iPhones and stuff like that. Uh, this time, this September, no different. So they released the iPhone 14, 14 Pro, 14 Max, and 14 Pro Max. <laughs> There's always a lot of uh, Maxes and Pros in there. Uh, so some of the, I'm not going to go through everything, but some of the things I wanted to highlight. Uh, there's an always on display, uh, which you kind of need for the lock screen widgets we talked about in a previous episode. So by having that always on display, it really makes that really, really powerful. Uh, the Pro has a two times camera. So people have been wanting that for a while. Uh, it's apparently eSIM only. So apparently they're going to be getting rid of SIM cards. So I'm just fascinated how that's all going to work out. Uh, we've talked about on the productivity show how we're, Tan and I are both fans of eSIMs anyway. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. And then the notch, the famous notch on <laughs> the iPhones now, they've turned into an area which is kind of like a pill shaped area, but they call it the dynamic island. And basically what this does is it turns that area into this like, little notification and activity area and apps can like use it to display stuff. It's almost like a, a useful version of the touch bar on MacBooks, <laughs> but at the top of your iPhone, it looks really, really cool. And we'll link to some videos that kind of like show how that works. Uh, and then the other feature is it has an emergency SOS via satellite. So I have a Garmin in reach uh, for when I go places without um, satellite access or without cell phone access. And it seems like we'll have to do some digging into it. Uh, it seems like the, uh, the iPhone 14 is gonna allow people maybe, we'll have to see, but maybe get rid of stuff like these specialized satellite emergency tools, you can actually use your phone for that. So that's pretty cool. Um, other things quickly, uh, Apple Watch 8 and Apple Watch Ultra. Uh, the Ultra is this like bigger, ruggedized titanium uh, version of the, of the uh, Apple Watch. Looks a little big for me personally, uh, but it has an action button, which apparently you can program uh, to, be, to do different things, or at least apps can program to do different things. So that seems really, really cool. Uh, and it has crash detection and low power mode. The 8 has that as well. And then finally, Tan, you're going to like this one. Uh, there's new AirPods Pro. So they have better noise canceling. They have better sound, apparently better battery life. So, so far, total win uh, and better fine my support. So who knows, maybe it doesn't even need an air tag. I don't know. Uh, and then it does touch control with volume. So yeah, those are some of the kind of like productivity things that are happening right now. Uh, how about you, Tan? Are you going to put your, uh, your order in for an iPhone 14 Pro Max? Well, I saw the announcement and I'm typically the guy that upgrades every other year. So I do have a 13 Pro and I'm also kind of a slow adopter. So I used to, when the first iPhone came out, uh, I was like a fast adopter. I was one of the first to get it. I remember lining up in San Francisco, um, right by Union Square. And I believe AT&T was the only one at that time that had um, the iPhone. So I remember lining up for hours and hours and hours just to get the first iPhone. Uh, but nowadays I'm like, oh, I'll just wait. You know, my current one is working just fine. Um, if there's something that really makes me want to jump over, then I'll do it, but I'm usually fine with whatever. And personally, I always recommend that people get the 512, uh, 512 uh, gigabyte camera, just because you don't have to worry about photos. And if you take a lot of photos and videos, you, you just never have to worry about it. Whereas with 256, uh, you kind of run into issues after a while. So I always recommend that. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited about the new features. Uh, personally, I'm a big AirPods fan. So that's something I'm always looking forward to in terms of upgrades. And hopefully they uh, they can use the Find My feature in that. So then I don't have to use my uh, Spirit Air Tag for this. Uh, as far as like the whole Wonderless thing. So it's interesting to see that they don't have like a a non-compete clause, I guess, when the founders started Superless, which is kind of interesting because usually when you get bought out, uh, there's some sort of compete agreement, but maybe that has ex expired or something. So excited to see what they're 
going to do with super lists because I think there's enough room and space for people to create to-do lists and, and managements of tasks that uh, appeal to a lot of different people. And as more people are getting into it, they have their own preferences. And you know, even when we look at cross-platform solutions, there are really only a few that really stand out. I think there's a lot more opportunity and growth there. Uh, but one thing I do like about Notion is the fact that it's cloud-based. So they allow updates to be very easy and frequent. And oftentimes you don't even know it that it's happening. And oftentimes when you have to download software, the upgrading process is a little more challenging. And then you run into, you know, developers running out of money and then figuring out like pricing and subscription problems and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. But um, overall, I think our space is really exciting and growing. And I think that's a, a good thing for everybody. Yeah, I say this every year, but this year might be the year I finally cave and get an Apple Watch, <laughs> mainly for the medical stuff. Uh, now that I'm getting getting up there up there in years, uh, some of it's starting to look really appealing. <laughs> All right, let's get into the topics for today. And the first topic I want to discuss is this. Actually, came from I was reading an article in The Verge about it. And the 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 thing I want to I'm curious to get your take on Tan is. Can a reduced distractions phone improve your attention? And I'm really curious what you think about these types of phones. And what started this whole thing is I was reading this article in The Verge, and I'll, we'll link to it in the show notes, uh, about the Nothing Phone One. Uh, kind of funny name, the Nothing Phone One. And it's basically an Android phone. It's not something I would necessarily buy, but it's an Android phone that has, like they say, a stripped down version of Android. Uh, but their main differentiating features, is it has these lights on the back and shapes that they call glyphs. And basically what you can do is you can set different glyph patterns to different, say, contacts or types of notifications or emails or whatever, so that if your phone happens to be lying there and you see like the back of your phone flash a certain way, then you know, oh, I have a text from my wife or something like that. So I better pick it up. And the converse of that, I guess, is that uh, if you don't see that flashing, then you know you don't need to like check your phone because you know nothing is important happening is is happening because nothing's blinking. And this whole thing, uh, anybody who's been around for a while will be laughing at this because my first reaction to this is like I was thinking about going back to my old BlackBerry days, uh, and any BlackBerry user will be very familiar with this concept because there was always be like a blinking light on the back of your BlackBerry. And so anytime somebody, myself included, would see your phone blinking, you would know you had some reason to grab your phone and check it out. Uh, and at first I was thinking like, do I really want to go back to being a slave to, <laughs> to the blinking light? Uh, but then, like I said, I was thinking about it from the flip side of that, which is if, if you don't see those glyphs or whatever, then you know that there's nothing important happening. So maybe you would be less likely to pick it up. And that's one way of having these reduced distractions phones is having the glyph. Uh, but there's you could even go further. There's one called the light phone, which I know was getting kind of a lot of buzz in the productivity world a while ago. And basically the, the light phone, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well, is about the size of an old iPhone 3. You were talking about going back to the early days of the, the iPhone. So it's a small phone with an e-ink screen. So a similar screen to the Kindle. Uh, and really it can't do too much except make calls. It can text, but it does have this feature called tools where it actually has a very simplified podcast player. Uh, it has a very simplified music player. So it can do some of the things that you would want a smartphone to do, but it's like I said, intentionally boring e-ink screen, uh, intentionally limiting. And what do you think about this concept of these distraction free phones like could you ever see yourself using them it's kind of like the complete opposite of the iphone 14 uh, that we were talking about earlier but uh, could you see yourself using these could you see yourself recommending it to somebody if they were um, maybe somebody who is uh, struggling with getting distracted by their phone uh, what do you think of all this personally i think it's super smart I think a lot of people would benefit from this because how many times do you check your phone and you go, okay, I wonder if I got an email or I wonder if I got a text or I wonder, you know, I just want to check this thing real quick. Well, if you can, from a distance, look at your phone and see that there's like no particular signal indicating that, that there's anything there for you to check, then you don't create this relationship or this habit of saying, oh, let me just check my phone to see what's there. So I think it's genius. I think it's something that should be designed in the phone hardware itself so that 
it doesn't make you want to check your phone all the time. And you just kind of, if you do want to check it, you just take a quick glance. You go, oh, no, there's nothing there. All right, I can just move forward and it makes it easier to focus. So I think it, it is actually something that all phone manufacturers should create because when we think about our environment, most people underestimate the power of our environment. It's actually much more influential than we think it is. So to give you an example, if I have cookies in my home and I don't even like, I'm a cookie lover. <laughs> like I like to eat cookies, but I'm not like a cookie monster or anything. But if I have cookies in my home, then I will find them and eat them at some point if I know that I have them, right? Just like if I have Sour Patch Kids at home, like those things will be gone. Uh, even though I can eat in moderation, it will be gone in a few days. So if I compare that to say not having it in my home whatsoever, even though I like it because it's not here, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not munching on it. I'm not going to even reach for them if I don't think I you know, want it. And so it's never going to be a problem, right? So I think most of us really underestimate the power of our environment. Just like one of the productivity tips we always tell people is if you can't focus, clean your desk because that's the first thing that you can do to kind of help you regain your focus. And if you have a messy desk, it just screams a uh, distraction because something you always like to say at Brooks is clutter is delayed decisions. So when you see clutter all over, it represents delayed decisions. And if you see that, you just, it's kind of pulling at your attention a little bit to say, oh yeah, I need to move this or I have to clean that. Or at some point I have to set this up, right? And there's like a manual there. I'm like, oh yeah, at some point I should read that. Like it's just taking away from your focus. So I think, um, your environment is so much more important than we think we uh, think it is. And so I do know one thing that people tend to do, uh, this is a feature that's actually currently already existing on most phones is they grayscale it, meaning um, you can actually set it up on your iPhone and most other phones as well. But I know for me, like if I tap the power button three times very quickly, it'll turn my phone into a grayscale. So uh, I've, I have a few friends who've done that and they find it very helpful where it, it doesn't become so addicting because when you look at your phone, everything is grayscale. So photos don't look that enticing. You, know, you can read the information that you're looking for, but it's not like as addicting compared to color. So uh, that's something that you might want to consider as well. I just think it's funny because when people were, especially when companies were switching employees over from Blackberries to smartphones, one of the things people were really like, complaining about is losing that blinking light. <laughs> and now it seems like we're going full circle and it's starting to come back. So who knows, maybe the iPhone 15 will have a blinking light. Well, we'll have to see. All right. Speaking of iPhones, let's go into topic number two. And uh, this is a feature of iOS 16 and Mac OS Ventura that I want to talk about. And it's the the feature called focus filters. And this is kind of, I think, a, a under the radar feature, which the more I kind of looked into it and learned about it, the more excited I got at the possibility for it. And so a topic we've talked about here on the podcast a lot is the focus modes in iOS, Mac OS, Android has it, Windows has it as well. And it's this ability to set different focus modes so that you could have like, just, just do not disturb, of course, but you can also have like a work one of a um, home one, a reading one, a napping one, an exercise one, a driving one, you know, whatever. You can set it so that only certain apps and certain people can notify you. Uh, and you can even do stuff like change wallpapers uh, and stuff like that. So that's been here for a while. Focus filters is a new feature coming out with iOS 16 and macOS Ventura. And basically that allows you to go to the next level and control what you can see inside apps. So focus modes originally could just control notifications, but now it can actually reach into the different apps and you can do things like in uh, maybe if you are in home mode or vacation mode and you start up your mail app, you can have it so that you actually literally don't even see your work email at all. Or maybe you have it in work mode so that your, your soccer dad uh, messages threads or something like that just don't even show up in uh, when you're in a work focus mode. Or maybe you could have it so that uh, you could 
depending on uh, whether you're traveling or whatever, you could have it in dark mode or light mode, or maybe if you're traveling in Safari, you could have a Safari tab group show up uh, with travel tools uh, like TripIt or whatever. Like there's all sorts of different ways that you can do this. Uh, and even better third party apps are gonna be able to start implementing this as well. So that imagine like a task manager where you only see certain projects depending on which focus mode you're in uh, or you know calendars and stuff like that. There's uh, The more I think about it, the more possibilities there are. Uh, and I would just encourage people if you are in the Apple ecosystem, unfortunately I'm not aware of an Android uh, feature that goes to quite this extent, uh, but once you install iOS 16, really encourage you to take a look at focus filters because uh, I think it's pretty awesome. Um, what do you think, Tan? Do you think, uh, can you, I know you're basically mainly uh, a do not disturb guy, which I totally get, uh, but what uh, what do you think of this possibility of having more third-party apps actually use this? When I saw this release, I immediately thought, oh, wow, this is really smart because if you can customize your whole phone within the app itself as well, you really get a customized experience. And I like the example that you gave earlier, which is, let's say you're, on vacation, the last thing you want to do is when you check your email is to see your work emails coming in, right? Even if you have a unified inbox. So if I was on vacation, I just want to check my personal email. If I open up my email app and I only saw my personal accounts, that would be awesome. Like I don't have to even worry about what's going on at work. And so it goes back to the whole idea of like the environment shapes us in many different ways and has so much more effect on us than we think it does. And I think with the focus filter feature, we can kind of shape our environment to the way we want it. However, I think what's going to be challenging for most people, and this is where education will have to come in and maybe we can contribute to, to this, uh, whether it's posting on a blog or talking about it on a podcast, but it will require some experimentation and it will require some setup to really take advantage of this. Like even with the, the focus modes that we have right now, I think we've talked about it a few times, but I doubt that many people will actually use it and set it up because it just takes a little bit of barrier to kind of get that going. And it also requires some experimentation, which is something not all of us have time for. So I'm hoping once I kind of get my hands on this and actually play with it more, we can do another episode on, on how we would use it. But just on top of my mind, I would say the email thing is super helpful, especially with the calendar as well. If I'm traveling or on vacation, I don't want to see particular calendars. Just like how in Fantastical, you can kind of switch between calendar sets very quickly. Like imagine doing something like that universally among other apps that you have going on, right? So I can see this being very powerful. And I, you know, you know me, like, I love vertical integration. Anytime you can vertically integrate anything, that's something I would always aim for, right? So if we can have a task manager and a note-taking app, right? And a calendar all working together somehow, like having that vertical integration, great. You create a lot of efficiencies. Uh, I'm not a big fan of like having a lot of different apps and tools that don't talk to each other because oftentimes it creates inefficiencies. And so... By having this across your whole operating system, I think it's really smart. So I'm really excited for this. Yeah, we record these live, uh, of course, in our, in our chat room. Uh, Melissa says that uh, just seems like do not disturb uh, is just easier, which of course it is. <laughs> it's uh, easier just to flip on do not disturb. So I think you're right. I think this is going to take some, and uh, focus modes so far haven't been super discoverable, I think, unless you're like really into this stuff. Uh, so I think you're right. I, and I'm hoping what will happen is third-party app developers are going to like do some work to try and make this discover a little more discoverable and show, uh, like Melissa says, show some actual like suggested ideas instead of just saying, hey, you can go in and do X, Y, and Z, uh, like really show some, some practical ways that people can do this. Uh, I think that's a great point, Melissa. All right, let's talk about the third topic. And uh, we recently had a, a team meeting that went completely derailed, but in the best possible way. Uh, it was really, I think, helpful and enlightening. Uh, so Tan, why don't you uh, why don't you talk about our, our third topic? So here's my take on this. I think personality tests are highly underrated for teams. And I'm not talking about teams like the app, but teams as a group of people. So to give you some context, we had a meeting about a week ago and we were talking about this new... Uh, initiative that we're trying to launch here at Asian Efficiency. So some of you might have heard that we launched our in-person workshops called the 25X Productivity System, 
where we teach our productivity methodology in person. And uh, we have some um, systems and initiatives around that to kind of help grow it, create more publicity and make sure there's eyeballs on it and um, also produce more content for the blog and for the podcast as well. So we have all these different initiatives going on. And because we have uh, a team, I said, okay, hey, here's the vision of what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to get as many eyeballs and awareness out about the workshop and the content that we create for our podcast and for our blog. And uh, just a FYI reminder, uh, everyone on the team has taken the personality tests, which we tend to use, which is called the Colby A test. So it's K-O-L-B-E, uh, Colby test. Uh, and there's an A version that we take. And so everyone has a score. And what I did on the meeting was I walked everyone through again, what their score was and what it meant and represented as well. So in the Colby, you actually have fact finding, follow through, uh, quick start and implementer. So there, there's like a rating from one to 10 for each. And there's no right or wrong score. It's just your kind of like tendencies of how you think and operate, right? And so what I did is on the meeting, I walked everyone through their, their score. So I would talk to Brooks, right, on the meeting and while everyone else is listening, say, hey, Brooks, this is your score. This is what your tendencies are. This is our this is a list of your strengths and this is a list of your weaknesses, right? And then I would go to Marmel and I would say the same thing. Marmel, this is your score. Uh, based on your score, you tend to do X, Y, and Z, but also here are your strengths and here are your weaknesses. And so I did this for every single person, including myself. And then everyone kind of got an idea of like where everyone is strong and where everyone's weak. But also then we talked about, okay, based on this initiative, how do we help each other out? So to give an example, I'm generally pretty weak at starting things. I have a hard time getting started. However, if you give me something that's half baked, then I'm really good at finishing it. So um, we talked about this initiative. I've said, okay, I'm going to struggle with starting things and getting things off the ground. But if you can help me like do the research, like get the files in one folder, kind of like get the setup done, then oftentimes you'll make it much easier for my job to actually get started and, and finish it. And so that's like one example, but I kind of did this for the whole team. And by the end of the meeting, everyone kind of knew like, okay, this is how we can work together. This is how we help each other out. And this is how we can explore our strengths and weaknesses uh, in the best way possible. So I thought that was really fun and it was not intentional on that particular meeting. But I think everyone that's listening to this, if you're someone who leads a team, this is something that you might want to consider. Like have everyone take a personality test and you as a team leader, we'll have to study the personality tests and really understand it. So maybe don't do it right away, like actually do it, the test yourself, understand it. And there's a book on Amazon on Colby that you can download. That's just one test that we take. Uh, that's the one I refer to. But uh, you can go check it out, read the book, and then have your team members take it. So then you can get on the same page, making sure that uh, you understand everyone's strengths and weaknesses, right? Even if you don't lead a team, but let's say you have a business partner, this is really helpful to have as well. Or even uh, with your significant other in your family, like it's kind of nice to know what your strengths and weaknesses are and how you think and operate. Um, so just like I'm sure Brooks, you know, with your kids, they don't respond and, uh, you know, are incentivized the same way or act the same way. Like one kid, you might be a little bit tougher on and the other kid, you have to be a little bit more gentle, right? Like it's just like when you're managing a soccer team, some kids you can be really hard on and some kids you have to be really gentle with. So if you want to get the most out of everyone, you really have to understand everyone's uh, personality. You know what I thought was interesting about the the tests is that we had all taken the tests a long time ago and we even have a page, our team page, where we have like everybody's contact information, but we also have everybody's Col Colby score. And so, you know, we all kind of like knew this already, but it was a very helpful reminder to me that it's not enough to just like do the test once, put it up, put it up somewhere and just like go on with your life. Like it's really helpful to revisit it from time to time. Um, and and so if if you are somebody who has done the Colby test, and we'll have links to information about the Colby test uh, down below uh, in the show notes as well, but whatever test you use, make sure you're kind of like revisiting it from time to time uh, and just, because it, it's, it's a good refresher. And like you said, another good thing I liked about it is you can't be 
you have to be vulnerable. Like it makes you be vulnerable in a way because if uh, if Tan is going through his Colby score, for example, Tan, if you are, and you know you're the number is right there that you are maybe slow to get started, and uh, you know I, I'm similar as well. Um, you know you it's right there. The number is right there. So it it, it makes it so that instead of kind of like trying to hide it, you're like, okay, well, this is what the number is. Now let's talk about how we can kind of like work with that. And so having it in a score like that, even if not everything fits everybody all the time, there'll always be exceptions, but just having a baseline and then to, it just allows you to have those conversations so that everybody can work together the best. So yeah, I thought, uh, I, I agree, personality tests, uh, I haven't always uh, thought this way, but I'm definitely a believer that personality tests, like you said, I think are really, really underrated. Uh, and you definitely want to revisit them from time to time. Well, that kind of wraps up uh, today's episode. Uh, it was good to to do this with you, Brooks, and lots of exciting releases coming out. And if you made it this far, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we always like to end things with an actionable item. So based on what you heard today, what is one action step that you can take today, whether it's setting up uh, a personality test for your team or setting up a focus filter, or even just thinking about like getting a different type of phone to reduce your distractions. Like what is it that you can take action on today based on the other things we've talked about? Because there's so many things you could be doing, but what's the one thing that you can do and commit to? Whether it's today, tomorrow, this week, we always like to implement and do it as fast as possible because that's how we get results. So figure that out. What's that for you? And if you want to find links to everything that we talked about today, you can find them in the show notes by going to theproductivityshow.com and uh, you'll find everything there, but whether it's this episode or the other episodes we've done in the past. And uh, if you're with us, uh, please leave us a review on Spotify, on, on podcasts, on Apple, and all the other places where we're at. We really appreciate you being here with us. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.